Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Grady. I'm the South Shore Regional Coordinator for the Massachusetts Bays National Estuary Partnership and Watershed Ecologist at the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Welcome to the Watershed Action Alliance of Southeastern Massachusetts 2021 Virtual Conference, Environmental Justice in Southeastern Massachusetts. This is session one, what is environmental justice? The Watershed Action Alliance is a group that works to protect and improve the health of the waterways and watersheds of the region for people, wildlife, and the environment. And it is made up of multiple organizations throughout Southeastern Massachusetts. If you're interested in supporting the Watershed Action Alliance and its free or low cost programs, there is going to be a link to donate in the chat box. We would like to thank our sponsors and supporters for this conference, the Island Foundation at our Eagle level and the NSRWA, Horsley Witten Group and Three Birds Consultants at our Osprey level. As you can see, we also have many other sponsors and supporters, including our individual donors. This is a webinar, so you will be able to hear our speakers, but they will not be able to hear you. Here are some tips for using Zoom if you are unfamiliar with it. If you have questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A to submit questions to the speakers. Use the chat if you have technical issues and to see any of our posts which have links to our resources. Please remember that the other attendees cannot see your chat messages at all or your questions until they've been answered. We are not going to be using the raise hand option in this webinar. So again, questions in the Q&A, technical issues in the chat. And now I would like to introduce our um, our moderator for this session, uh, Katie Canfield, um, who will be doing a land acknowledgement and helping coordinate the remainder of this session. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Um, so before jumping into the land acknowledgement, um, I think that it's essential as we move into our webinar today that we also acknowledge um, and condemn the shootings that happened in Atlanta last night. I know my heart's been heavy in thinking of my friends in the larger Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander community that has been burdened with increased racism and hate crimes throughout the pandemic. And this is yet another um, escalation demonstrating the way that violence, gender and race all interplay in our country. Today, we are talking about environmental justice in this webinar and tackling racial injustice is foundation, foundational to the history and advancement of the environmental justice movement. The mobilization of grassroots, grassroots activists um, around racial justice this past year shows how we truly can bring this conversation of racial and environmental justice to households across the country, including making racially just policy that equitably protects those of the most marginalized identities. So today we're going to be talking about issues that affect people across a variety of identities due to various environmental and societal challenges that are happening at a much slower burn than the acute acts of last night. Um, but there is absolutely work for us all to do in tackling both forms of injustice, both acute and racial and environmental. Um, and we appreciate your attendance on a day that weighs heavily on all of us. So that being said, um, the land acknowledgement is also important. Um, so while we are speaking to each other over Zoom today, it's also important to acknowledge the unceded native lands that we are all speaking to you from. So looking across southeastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island, we are located on the lands of the Wampanoag, Massachusetts, Narragansett, Poconocet, Manasseean, and Nauset people, and likely many other tribes as well. Especially as we talk about environmental justice, it's important to acknowledge that the people whose territories we are occupying continue to face undue burdens of environmental justice and when they are involved in tackling these injustices, expectations of participation and resolution are often defined by westernized norms and ways of life. As we all work to improve the justice of our approaches and efforts, we need to decolonize our interactions with the environment. 
that will start with listening to the native voices in the communities in which we live and yielding our privilege to begin the process of reparations to these tribes whose lands we occupy. With that in mind, today's session is about defining environmental justice and giving understanding of what this movement is all about and sharing examples from our region of southeastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island to begin to understand the environmental injustices that our neighbors are facing um, and how these communities have responded to environmental injustice. First, we are going to be hearing from Reverend Betsy Sowers, who is the Minister for Earth Justice at Old Cambridge Baptist Church. Um, and is also on the board of the Four River Residents Against the Compressor Station. Uh, she came to her lifelong call to peace and justice via her first um, post-college job as a flight attendant, um, which gave her the gift of global awareness and brought her to Cambridge, where she found um, Old Cambridge Baptist Church, a congregation that confirmed and encouraged her call. After earning a master's degree in social work from Boston College and a master's of divinity from Harvard Divinity School, she was called to the Department of Church and Society of the American Baptist Churches of Massachusetts, first as a staff person and later as director. Uh, Betsy was an educator and advocate on peace and justice matters to the Baptist churches in the Commonwealth. She also served the Massachusetts Council of Churches as adjunct associate director. Uh, a clear call out of retirement to climate justice service has both surprised and energized her for another chapter of activist ministry. Um, so Betsy is going to talk to us now about a high level uh, response to the question, what is environmental justice? Thank you, Katie. And thank you, Sarah, and Dory, and all of the other folks at Watershed Action Alliance. Um, I want to begin by congratulating you all for choosing to include uh, environmental justice as you work on restoring the health of our watersheds. There's lots to cover, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, don't worry about taking notes and copying links because everything is going to be avail made available to everyone uh, later in the in the uh, or after the program. What is environmental justice or EJ? It is a set of legal and policy frameworks that affect defined communities. So environmental justice exists within the larger climate movement that encompasses climate change, all kinds of forms of pollution, uh, the clean energy transition, but that legal framework for overburdened communities it is what makes it EJ. The federal definition environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. This goal will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live learn and work. So note that environmental justice is not just fair treatment of vulnerable people by folks in power. It includes meaningful involvement of impacted communities in decisions that affect them, or at least it should. Now, the Massachusetts um, environmental justice policy is rooted in three things. The first is Article 97 of our Constitution. The second is an executive order 552 from Governor Deval Patrick. And the third is our 2017 environmental justice policy. Um, now, a few months ago, Sabrina Martin did a presentation to Watershed uh, Association in which she talked about these three pieces of mass EJ uh, law. And you can find them at the link there and it will be under month four. So I'm not going to delve into the details about each of those um, policies, but you can find them easily in her presentation. Rhode Island, again, is very similar to the federal, just a little bit more concise. So why do we need environmental justice laws? Well, for more than 50 years, the number one way to locate pollution in the United States is to look at the zip codes where people are predominantly people of color. And the number two way to find them is the zip codes of people 
who have low income, low wealth. Uh, and in spite of all of the policy changes over the years, that is still the case 50 years later. Why? Uh, in part because of environmental racism, which is defined environmental injustice as environmental injustice that occurs within a racialized context, both in practice and policy. So if you want to read a little more on how systemic racism determines the health outcomes for Black Americans, there's a link there. And in spite of the fact that it's talking about health outcomes, those health outcomes are largely due to the pollution that is in the neighborhoods where these folks live. So I want to clarify before I go on that environmental racism is not the same thing as bigotry and intentional acts of hate. Uh, but it is structural in the built into the system. The patterns do date to intentional practices like redlining that for many decades forced people of color and poor people into uh, living into industrial areas and areas that are flood prone. But now seemingly neutral policies can have disparate impacts on communities of color. For example, in Massachusetts, the Baker administration has a preference to cluster polluting and, uh, industries close together so as to preserve the rest of the state. Well, that sounds good on paper, but when you combine it with the power of well-to-do white communities to keep polluters out of their communities, it ends up with overburdened sacrifice zones, almost always communities of color and low wealth. So there may be no overt intent to be racist, but the racially unjust disparate impacts still happen. So sacrifice zones cause immediate injustice, injustice and injury to the affected communities, but the pollution that starts there eventually affects all of us and our entire planet. And this is a crucial connection, I think, for all of us. This uh, quote that's at the bottom of the page. You can't have climate change without sacrifice zones, and you can't have sacrifice zones without disposable people, and you can't have disposable people without racism. Um, that's from Hop Hopkins at the Sierra Club, and I like to include it whenever I give a talk on environmental justice. So what is an EJ population? On this slide, the colors uh, matter because uh, when you see the, you'll see them later on the maps that we're going to uh, display. 25% or more of the residents are minority, then that would be in yellow on the map, or in blue, 25% or more of the residents have English isolation, and that means they're generally immigrant communities where there is um, limited ability uh, in the English language. And third, in green, the median household income is at or below 65% of statewide median income. You'll see other colors on the maps, and that's where these uh, original three categories overlap and, and make other color combinations of those three things. There are other impacted groups that may fall outside the definition, such as women, children, the elderly, and people with disabilities who would, are then doubly impacted uh, by being in the environmental justice communities. So here's a map of southeastern Massachusetts, and you can see the colors that show you where the environmental justice communities are. Uh, if you go to this link, which will be provided to you later, you can actually go to a whole set of maps that are interactive so that you can click on them and enlarge them to see right where you're living and see where the environmental justice uh, communities are that are near you. And that's probably gonna also tell you where the pollution is that is near you that needs uh, action. So some of the concerns in EJ communities, uh, water and air pollution, and I think uh, Carrie's going to say more about water pollution in a few minutes when it's her turn to speak. Lack of access to green spaces, gardens, fresh food, heat islands from lack of tree canopies, poor quality housing that emits more carbon from old heating systems, poor insulation, and that creates both indoor and outdoor air pollution that these uh, folks have to live with. There are tribal concerns about development and water rights access on uh, historic indigenous lands. There is, and this is a key one, lack of access to engagement in decisions that impact those communities, their own communities. 
And finally, physical, mental, and spiritual health problems. We know that asthma, cancer, neurological diseases, and COVID are far higher in EJ communities. And on top of that, you have chronic stress from the racism um, and the uh, economic issues, uh, and then all of this pollution that combines, compounds those health pro problems and leads to mental health and spiritual uh, concerns. So wait a minute, you might say, what's not working? I thought we had all of these laws and policies to protect these communities. There are a number of reasons that they don't always work right, and I'm just going to highlight three of them very quickly. The first one is the failure to commit, consider com cumulative impacts of pollution at both federal and state levels when deciding whether or not to give permits to new polluters. For example, where I live in Weymouth, only the pollution that would be emitted from Enbridge's proposed fracked gas compressor station was considered when they looked at permitting that facility. The existing pollution from nearby emitters, which was already in violation of EPA limits, was ignored. As a result, the amount of pollution from the new facility was deemed, well, that's not enough to trigger engaging the adjacent environmental justice communities in the decision making that would affect their lives. So second, the intent to discriminate versus disparate impacts. Current federal and state law is often interpreted to require legal proof of intent to discriminate, even when you can see when there's documented disparate impact on EJ communities. And as you can imagine, it's almost impossible to pr prove that a polluter intends to discriminate. And perhaps, as I said earlier, they may not even intend to do so, but environmental justice will never happen until dis disparate impact alone is legal grounds for engaging EJ communities in citing decisions. Finally, regulatory capture is a term that describes the too cozy relationship between regulators and industry that results from a revolving door whereby many professionals bounce back and forth between jobs in the industry and jobs in government regulation. So regulators are motivated to give the industry what it wants because the industry might be their next employer. Just a quick example here, here's Weymouth and Quincy and Braintree. Here are your EJ communities. Here's where the compressor is going to be. So you'd think these people would be involved in the decision-making, but no. Um, and here are the nine other toxic emitters in the region that were ignored because we don't uh, count cumulative impacts. And here uh, you can see the construction site and this big apartment building is in an environmental justice uh, community. It's low income senior housing uh, where most of the people are Asian American non-English speakers. So that's the way those uh, three things, and I suppose I should also mention the regulatory capture at other Department of Environmental Protection, uh, which sided with, um, with, the, uh, with Enbridge at every turn. So there is good news. There are, there are some solutions. There are things uh, happening to make some changes. Uh, first of all, the newly appointed chairman at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, has stated that environmental justice and climate change will now be central in the permitting of energy projects. And if you know anything about FERC, this is a 180 degree change from past practice where FERC has basically approved every project uh, that came before it for the last 30 or 40 years, every, every polluter, it was just fine and go ahead and cite it wherever you like. So that's a big change. Second, the EPA Office of Environmental Justice uh, is kind of back up and running and starting, uh, just recently started again, having uh, virtual public meetings. You can check out their website at the link there. And if you wanna be notified about public meetings, uh, they go by region. So uh, if you wanna attend a public meeting uh, when it's in this part of the country, there's an uh, email address there that you can uh, just uh, shoot them an email and say you wanna be on the list to get those notices. Third, a uh, new federal policy as of January is to mainstream environmental justice across all government agencies. And this is new. Uh, there's a link there to an article about it where you can learn more. Uh, and of course, all of these good things 
are the result of years of organizing, of people getting involved and telling people in government that we want environmental justice. There is good news in the growth of public involvement, especially amongst young people. Uh, I've given you a couple examples on the slide of organization of, of two of just the many organizations that are working on environmental justice. Uh, if you go to New England Renews Alliance, you can click on each state because each state within New England uh, has an EJ group working in, in the states. Um, and the Just Recovery Organization is at the federal level working on environmental justice as a part of the COVID recovery. And of course, you all are already involved in watershed associations, and those are great places to get engaged in uh, environmental justice in your own watersheds. And last but not least, as I promised when I started, I'm going to give you a little update on what's happening legislatively on environmental justice in Massachusetts right now. And that's another place for you to get engaged. Uh, there's an organization called Mass Power Forward. The, the link is up here. That is an umbrella group of over 200 uh, environmental, uh, religious, labor, uh, all kinds of groups are involved in it. Um, and we just had our, uh, our environmental lobby day a couple of weeks ago. And so we, there are lots of resources on the new legislative session to be had. If you wanna find your mass legislator, there's a link there. And then I'm just gonna go quickly over the bills and be finished. The first one is actually left over from last year. It's S9, the next generation climate bill. It contains last year's environmental justice bill provisions, which include requiring uh, cumulative impacts and climate change to be considered when evaluating pro projects. So this would be huge for Massachusetts. And um, it, was, it was actually vetoed by Governor Baker at the end of the last session after being passed, reintroduced, kind of a long story, but finally on Monday, it passed the state Senate. The House is considering it right now. So this would be a great time to contact your House person, House rep, and ask them to pass the Senate version and be prepared to override a veto if necessary. This would really put Massachusetts back into climate leadership nationally. It's a, it's a really great bill. Now there's also new legislation this year that was not in Ms. Martin's presentation that you will find on the, the website of the Watershed Association. So I'm just gonna hit those very quickly. Um, at the uh, Mass Power Forward uh, briefings, we got fact sheets and I've got a link to them uh, right here. This is a one page thing with links to all of the bills, the bill numbers, the sponsor, and a fact sheet on every bill so that when you talk to you, your legislator or email her or him, you'll know, you know, you'll know what to, to say. You'll have a couple of talking points to say why they should support these bills. The bills are in three suites, if you will. The first were developed by the Environmental Ju uh, Justice Table, which is a group of in local environmental justice organizations from across the Commonwealth. I believe there's three bills in their set. Um, in addition to the fact sheet that you'll find uh, right there, they held a, uh, a, br a 30 minute briefing. So if you wanna see the, uh, the video of their briefing and get everything you could possibly want to know, that's where to look. The second set of environmental justice bills comes from Mass Renews Alliance, which is part of that New England Renews Alliance I mentioned in the previous um, slide. They're holding um, a briefing on March 22nd, and there's a link to that uh, if you want to actually get um, a visual and spoken uh, briefing. But again, everything you need should be on the fact sheets as well. And the last thing is the 100% Clean Act which is actually a reboot from the last session that did not get passed. It is not technically an environmental justice bill, but of course, if we had 100% clean energy, that would eliminate an awful lot of those polluters that are sitting in environmental justice communities. So in a way, it is an environmental justice bill. And there's a link again to um, a 30 minute briefing on it there uh, on YouTube, or you can just go and get the facts at these uh, at this link right here. So I know that's a lot and you will be getting all of these links uh, afterwards. Uh, but for now, I just want to thank you all for your attention and your commitment to 
environmental justice. And I will um, be answering questions in the Q&A or possibly um, verbally at the end when we do a, a live Q&A later. But for now, thank you. And I will pass it back to Katie. Thank you, Betsy. Um, there is actually one question that we wanted to ask you now. So the map you showed of the environmental justice communities in Massachusetts was from 2010. And a lot of people were wondering oh. um, about if there's an updated version or, um, yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, those EJ maps are based on the census. And the last census was was last was in 2020, but the results are not all collated and available yet to update the maps. So the, the maps we have are based on the 2010 census. I meant to say that. I'm sorry about that. No, but no, yeah, no. there will be new maps as soon as all the census data is collected and then transferred over into uh, the new maps. Great. And then those are maps for, for from the state of Massachusetts or where did they come from? That was the one other question. That particular one uh, is from the state of Massachusetts. I, but there's a link to it on the slide. So there, there is a link on the slide. Great. Thank you so much, Betsy, Welcome. for giving us the overview of what environmental justice is and specifically what it looks like here um, in our region. Um, next, we're going to hear from Carrie Malloy Snyder, who is the advocacy director for the Neponset River Watershed Association, which is a member supported organization working to protect and provide meaningful access to the water, land, and wildlife of the Neponset River and, and its watershed. Carrie assists communities in developing and implementing watershed protection policies and advances the Neponset River Watershed Association's policy agenda. She has extensive experience in public policy and prior to her current role, Carrie served as the Assistant Director of the Public Health and Tobacco Policy Center at Northeastern University Law School. She also has worked as Associate Counsel to the New Jersey Legislature on Environmental Net natural resource and agricultural policy issues, and chief of staff to a Massachusetts state senator. Uh, Carrie earned uh, her JD through Suffolk University Law School and has a BA from Boston University. Uh, so Carrie is going to talk to us now um, about some more specific examples of environmental injustice in the region. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for being here today. Um, so there's no way I can discuss all of the ways um, that environmental injustice manifests itself. Uh, but I do hope that the few examples that I can go over um, will help you think about your own communities and recognize opportunities to, um, to achieve environmental justice. Um, I've, uh, I've divvied these up into categories, but you'll see as I go through um, some of these, most of these issues sort of um, weave their way through um, all environmental justice communities. So first, I want to talk about communication. Um, we want people to engage with recreational water resources and their surrounding green spaces. However, as a result of past industrial activity um, in the Neponset River and elsewhere, there are some pollution imp that impact. There is some pollution that impacts uh, the type of recreation um, activities that are safe. So the Lower Neponset is located within vibrant urban and residential parts of Boston, Milton, and Quincy. I've dropped the arrow here down in Mattapan by Ryan Playground. And you can see we've got Boston here, Milton, Quincy, and really the river um, is the border between um, Boston and, and Milton and Quincy. Um, and I'll overlay this map. And again, anywhere on these maps where you see a bold color is an environmental justice community. Um, designated as a result of the 2020, 2010 census. Um, so there's a large portion of the population here um, that's been designated as environmental justice as a result of uh, minority populations, um, income, and English isolation, um, which is where there are um, a lot of community members who predominantly speak a language other than English. Now, legacy industrial pollution has left deposits of um, polychlorinated biphenols, or PCBs, in the sediments at the bottom of the Neponset River. Now, since they're trapped in the sediments at the bottom, boating and fishing are both safe and encouraged. Um, however, it's not safe to eat the fish that you catch. Um, but communicating this, um, you know, the two messages, encouraging recreational activity 
as well as explaining that uh, it's not safe to eat the fish, um, isn't always straightforward and can leave some community members at risk. The symbols and language that we're currently using on signage, and this is an example, um, they're not universal and they're not clearly understood by everyone. Um, the community here has attempted to address this issue for a number of years, um, but because of jurisdictional issues, it's been difficult. Um, DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, owns the land under and around the river, but the Department of Public Health um, is in charge of uh, public health signage. Um, so getting the two agencies to talk together has been hard. And I just want to note um, that this, is, this could be an example of something that Reverend Sowers mentioned, which is environmental injustice also includes the exclusion of community voices in decision making. And that exclusion can be exacerbated by difficult to navigate bureaucratic systems. Um, so fortunately, there's a success story on the horizon. Um, the neighborhood associations um, in the area have partnered together. Um, they've been speaking with DCR and DPH, and we expect to see new signs um, written in the predominant community languages of English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole um, later this year. Um, I don't have a mock-up yet, but here's an example of a more inclusive sign um, that we found in Quincy. So next I'll talk about some water pollution issues. Um, <clears throat> industrial operations are often located near communities where the majority of residents are non-white immigrant um, or lower income, as Reverend Sowers mentioned. Um, and these environmental justice communities bear the brunt of pollution and other negative environmental impacts um, in an area. So this is Providence, um, and this is uh, the port of Providence on the west side of the Providence River. Um, and it's Rhode Island's major industrial port. And the industries here um, include the import, storage, and export of fossil fuels, scrap yards, cement distribution, large salt piles, and a lot of other things. Um, and there's significant concern about the impact of these port operations on the quality of life for residents in the area. Um, rain and, uh, sorry, here's the, the map again. This comes from the EPA. Um, and you'll see the environmental justice community surrounding, here's the port here. Um, and, uh, and so it has a significant impact. Um, rain and snow melt pick up um, all manner of pollutants from all of these properties um, before direct before running into the river directly without any treatment whatsoever um, and carrying all of those pollutants with them. Um, and the industrial activity also obstructs public access to the river wherever they are. Um, so in response to this issue, um, a group of community members formed the People's Port Authority. Um, and it's a group that is demanding community oversight um, over the Port of Providence to hold it accountable for reducing pollution in the area. Um, they're joining forces uh, with other community groups and they're uh, aiming, to, their goal is to get representation on the Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council, uh, which is the state's leading governing body on coastal development. And again, we're talking about having a voice, um, having a seat at the table and you know, having a voice in these uh, decision-making processes. Um, and Providence is not the only place that we see this. Um, as Reverend Sowers just spoke about, the area around the Four River Bridge has been the site of a lot of industrial activity, um, negatively impacting fish populations and recreational access to the surrounding community. And I just wanna echo something that she said, which is the cumulative impacts of industry um, have to be taken into account if we're ever going to achieve some semblance of equity in these areas. So next, drinking water um, contamination. Um, the first example I'll use is um, Hyannis. Uh, the Hyannis Water District encompasses the most commercial parts of Barnstable. Um, it's got the mall, the airport, um, manufacturing, and a firefighting academy. And importantly, the water district's wells are located near the airport. Uh, it's at the airport here, the firefighting um, academy is over here, and each of these icons here, the bright green faucets, um, are the wells um, for the district. And because they're located so close to the airport and the firefighting academy, um, they have become contaminated with PFAS. You probably have heard PFAS in the news lately. Um, it's considered a forever chemical, and that means it doesn't break down over time like some other chemicals do. Um, and it's been linked with um, significant health impacts. Now, as you can see from this map, um, as I've overlaid the environmental justice designation, um, 
these wells and these um, this PFAS contamination is happening right in the middle of an environmental justice community. Um, and again, everywhere where, where it's colored on these maps is an environmental justice community. Um, the water contamination got so high several years ago, that the town had to close the wells and buy water, uh, buy bottled water for residents. Um, and importantly, they were buying the water for residents they could um, contact by phone and email. So again, that communication issue comes in, were they reaching everybody that they needed to um, with, uh, with this um, service? My understanding is that um, today uh, they have made significant changes to address the issue, um, but we'll, con we'll continue to see this in communities across the state and across the country um, as we learn more about PFAS and um, where it uh, is contaminating our water resources. Another issue that arises in many areas is lead contamination. Um, and the most common source of lead in drinking water is from old lead pipes, uh, which were used in service lines connecting homes to the main water pipe in the road um, until about 1940 when it was prohibited. Um, lead can also be found in soldering um, that connects pipes. Um, and you find this in houses uh, that, were, that were built pre-1950. Um, so lead enters the drinking water um, by leaching from the pipes, especially when water is acidic. Um, and lead is, is also linked with some severe health impacts, um, notably um, developmental issues with children. Now, Brown University researchers have looked in, at this um, issue um, recently in Rhode Island. So I'm using Rhode Island as an example. Um, and they found that low income and minority children in the state are more likely to live in urban neighborhoods. And urban neighborhoods typically have older housing, um, which is a major source of lead poisoning. The study further confirmed that the burden of lead exposure is unsurprisingly disproportionately placed on low-income people and people of color in Rhode Island, as is the case in many communities across the country. Um, in fact, the study showed that African-American and Hispanic children had lead levels of 65 and 53% um, higher, respectively, than white children. Um, they also looked at children who qualified for free school lunch um, had lead levels 50% higher than those who did not. Now the legal responsibility um, or ownership of these service lines is generally split. I'm gonna go back here. Um, so typically you have the municipality or the, um, the utility owns this section. So it's in the road, right up to the property line. And then the rest of this is the responsibility of the homeowner um, to replace those lead pipes and the lead soldering with non-lead pipes. And this can be really expensive. Um, and so it puts lower income homeowners and renters at a significant disadvantage. Um, and the incentive programs provided by the state and federal government um, aren't always set up in a way to make it practically accessible for low income families. Um, additionally, some of these um, programs put the onus on the renter to actually uh, report lead in the water. Um, and that leaves them vulnerable to eviction from an angry landlord who doesn't want to have to replace them. Um, the other issue is even if we, the municipality replaces their part, um, that doesn't reduce the lead exposure over the long term. Um, and in fact, over the short term, it can increase uh, the lead levels in drinking water. Um, so here's, here's just a graph um, from that uh, I think it was a 2017 study that looked at um, lead exposure in children here. Um, and this graph shows that we've, we've made great strides in reducing um, overall exposure to lead in children, um, but you still find that um, black children are far more um, exposed uh, than their, their counterparts. Um, now this last map shows the results of a 2010 analysis um, of lower income communities and pre-1950 housing. Um, and again, you see the urban areas, um, we've got Providence up here, um, they're including um, the identified uh, environmental justice communities. Um, so we really need to make sure that these older homes are retrofitted with non-lead pipes. And to do that, we need to take the financial burden off of those who can least afford it and those who are most at risk as a result of it. So finally, I'm gonna talk about stormwater flooding. Um, environmental communities are often found in built out environments. 
Um, and when we build out, we cover the soil with hard, impervious surfaces, um, which make it impossible for rain to seep into the soil. So you see here under undisturbed um, conditions, we have 50% of um, precipitation seeping into the soil as it should. But as we build out, um, we create these hard surfaces um, that prevent the water from getting into the soil. And it has no choice, but to, it has no alternative, but to run off of, of this. Um, and if it has nowhere to go, it's going to cause flooding. Um, it's also picking up pollutants as it, as it does this. So as we've built out, um, we've created stormwater management systems. So these are a series of pipes under the ground that carry the water from these hard surfaces and bring them through pipes um, to the nearest water body. Um, importantly, this water is not treated. So again, it's picking up anything that's on these hard surfaces and bringing it directly into the stream. Um, and it is one of the most significant sources of pollution um, in our waterways. So I know we're talking about um, environmental justice and not climate justice, um, but because we have a lot of urban and suburban environmental justice communities, um, this is really an issue that we have to address immediately. Um, climate change is not coming, it's here, um, and it's brought with it um, significant changes in precipitation patterns. Um, in June of 2020, several Massachusetts towns were experienced a burst of extreme rainfall. Um, and this is an image from downtown Norwood, Massachusetts, um, which is an environmental justice community. And it shows what happens when our stormwater management system is working as it's intended. And I do mean that this system here was working as it was intended. The problem is in the Northeast, um, we built our towns a long time ago. So our infrastructure is old, it's outdated. And even if it's well-maintained, it's undersized for these large um, storms that, storm events that we're seeing through climate change. Um, this same storm flooded out Norwood Hospital and it's still closed today. Um, so that means that everybody in Norwood and surrounding towns now have to find emergency medical services at other hospitals. And the closest one is six miles away. Um, so Norwood and other communities are, um, are looking at ways to ensure that vulnerable populations are protected during these storms um, and from the other negative impacts of climate change. Um, and they're doing this partly through the MVP program, which is a state program that helps towns to identify and prioritize actions that will uh, help protect not only the environment, but also um, the people who live in these communities. Um, and just as, um, as Reverend Sauer said, you know, environmental justice communities are also going to bear the brunt of um, climate change. Um, so this program is, is fantastic, um, but it's not, funded well enough to help all of the towns achieve everything they need to to make their communities more resilient to climate change. Um, there are several bills pending before the legislature right now. Um, it's very early on in the session, but you may see some calls to action uh, to support some of those bills so that we can really make sure that our towns can, uh, can do this to protect um, their communities. Um, so access uh, public access to recreational waterways is, um, is a significant issue. And so we've devoted an entire session um, next week to it. Uh, so it's an, it's, it's an issue that, that is faced by a lot of um, environmental justice communities, whether it's physical barriers, legal restrictions, pricing challenges, or simply lack of knowledge that um, a recreational waterway is nearby. Um, so our panelists next week have a ton of information to share and I hope to join us. Um, and register. I'm sure Dory will share the link, um, but we would love to see you. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Um, Katie, I will stop sharing my screen now. Great. Thank you. thank you, Carrie, um, for giving us a lot of examples of what this looks like in our region. Um, and I want to remind all of our uh, participants to please, if you have questions, we'll answer them at the end, um, but please do put them in the Q&A um, so um, we can get ready to tackle those after our next presenter. Um, our final presentation is from Amelia Moore, who is a social sociocultural anthropologist with a background in environmental biology, feminist science studies, and island studies. Uh, her research involves projects in Cabo 
excuse me, and collaborations in the Bahamas, Indonesia, and the state of Rhode Island. Most recently, she has begun to explore connections between history, ecology, race, gender, and justice within the field of marine science and policy. Um, and she is an associate professor of marine affairs at the University of Rhode Island. Um, and she's going to narrow this in for us even more um, around research on Block Island. So Amelia, if you wanna take it away. So before I begin, I wanna echo Katie and express my horror at the shootings in Atlanta last night and what we will may yet learn was an extreme act of anti-Asian violence. I hope that we will all stand in solidarity with everyone who's fighting for an anti-racist nation and that we will all make it known in our communities and networks that there's no place for such violence in our society. We cannot let this tide of racism continue to rise and our very survival depends on it. My talk today is prepared in collaboration with Marianne Goburn Matthews, Marcus Nevius, and the project I'll describe here today um, also involved Katie Canfield early on, um, so she's quite familiar with it. This talk takes up a number of the themes introduced already by Betsy and Carrie, but it's a little different than the others because as an anthropologist, I tell stories in different ways. But don't worry, I'm still talking about environmental justice. This is Manassees, an island just a few miles offshore in the state of Rhode Island. It is a place that is highly significant in local and regional history but it's not always visible or accessible. Most of you have likely never been to Manassees, even if you have been to the island depicted here. And some of you may not have even heard of Manassees. It's my hope that you might gain more insight about the multiple and multiplying facets of environmental justice as you learn about this place. I didn't have the capacity to see Manassees when I moved to take up my position at URI in 2015. I'd never heard of the word or the island before, and I had never even heard of the conventional, conventional settler name for the place, which is Block Island. I'm trained as a sociocultural anthropologist, so you might think that learning to see Manassees comes easier to me than most. But at first, I only saw the wind turbines in what is known as the Block Island wind farm. I was fascinated by the introduction of this new infrastructure into the regional fishing and sailing seascape. And I wanted to know how the people and businesses of the region were adapting, or not, to something as massively visible as America's first offshore wind farm. I joined a research team in 2016 to investigate this question for the federal government. My colleagues and our government funders knew a lot about energy transitions, infrastructure, and public assessment, but they knew nothing and therefore could teach me nothing about something as hidden as Manassees. In retrospect, there were signals that Manassees was all around me while I was doing field work on Block Island, but I didn't know what I was seeing or hearing. Local residents would tell me about the struggle to build the wind farm and how disruptive the construction process had been for their daily lives. There were whole weeks when the process was shut down because the earth moving operation to bury the, the energy cables connecting the turbines to the onshore grid had encountered archeological sites that required investigation. What was the wind farm construction unearthing? Most residents didn't know. As part of my research goal to understand the appeal of the island for regional tourism, I would often ride a bicycle all over the island on summer days, reveling in the smell of wildflowers and meadow grasses along the roadways. If I had time, I would sometimes ride to one of the natural areas of the island to go for a little hike. More than 44% of the island is held in conservancy in perpetuity. It is said by the Islands Conservancy Organization that this achievement provides recreational areas, preserves scenic views, protects crucial habitats for rare plants and animals, and protects the natural recharging of the island's sole source aquifer, its only water supply. But the conservancy said nothing about manatees. And there was the Island Museum, which told the stories of the dead white men whose names are embossed on Settler's Rock, whose tombstones are featured prominently in the island's main cemetery, and whose descendants still annually celebrate their arrival. Some rooms of the museum also displayed unearthed cultural materials and models representing the way people used to live on the island, 
before European invaders and the founding families changed the place forever. I perused the contents of these rooms in my spare time. I was looking for examples of early forms of energy infrastructure on the island, but I could not see manistees staring back at me from the shelves. So although Block Island has a richly documented settler history and this museum that displays archeological materials from the deep past, public memory has erased the contemporary presence of indigenous people on the island. The process of erasure has been so successful that nearly all public reference to indigenous life on the island is in the past tense. Popular lore claims the last Indian to live on the island, Isaac Church, died in 1886. This is an image of the Indian cemetery on the island. Public memory also works against black history and presence on the island. The so-called only African-American to live there, Fred Benson, died in 1996. Both of these claims about the last Indian and the only African-American are apocryphal. The last Indian had children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, and there are records of African slaveholding and several different waves of black migration to the island over many generations. But these erasures have enabled the solidification of settler narratives and the uncomplicated use of valuable island space for tourism, vacation home real estate, and resource use. Essentially, for most Black Islanders and for the legal procedures of the state and federal government, there are no populations of Indigenous or African Americans on Block Island, and Manaseans no longer exist. Today, several of my colleagues and I are collaborating with the Black Indigenous Island family and many other partners on an ambitious project to remind New Englanders of the island's original name in the Narragansett Indigenous language, which you know as Manasees and to explore the interconnected and underappreciated history of the survival of the island's indigenous and enslaved people. Our goal is to re-narrate the history of Block Island from the perspective of indigenous and African-Americans, beginning with the intermingled presence of coastal Narragansett, Wampanoag, Niantic, and Pequot peoples before the arrival of the 16 founding white settler families in the 17th century and proceeding all the way to this very moment. But at this point, you might be wondering, what this has to do with an envir environmental justice. So let me try and show you by bringing us back to the wind farm. New England offshore energy development is a legal process that perpetuates settler colonial hierarchies even as it promotes alternative sources of energy. The recognition of indigenous peoples in this process is complicated to say the least. Although there is a legal prioritization of members of federally recognized tribes as certain kinds of stakeholders in offshore development planning, members from some non-federally recognized tribes have mixed access to these processes. So for instance, members of the federally recognized Narragansett tribe participated alongside Nipmuc tribal members of Massachusetts who are recognized by the state but not the federal government in the Block Island wind farm planning process. But of course, no Manaseans were included in the project. In indeed, the term Manasean does not even appear in the best practices report that resulted from the collaboration between native peoples and scientists involved in the Block Island wind farm. The inconsistent inclusion of people of indigenous descent illustrates the historically complicated relationship between the extractive US government, settler society, and indigenous populations that can help perpetuate the myth of indigenous extinction in the region. Further, the governmental planning processes that legally mandate cultural heritage research in the siting of energy infrastructure may also perpetuate static visions of indigenous cultures. Although scientists involved in the Block Island wind farm planning process noted the problematic nature of using the term prehistoric to describe material culture identified during explorations of submerged sites, because prehistoric implies that history begins only with European occupation of the Americas, their substitution of the prefix paleo, as in paleo landscapes and paleo cultural sites, as referring to old or ancient times without reference to any particular time period, continues to relegate indigenous people's presence to the relatively safe distance of ancient history. Energy transition in the form of offshore wind farms is big business in New England today. The Block Island wind farm was the first in the US but it was really just a pilot for the massive expansion of offshore wind turbines all along the Atlantic seaboard. The draft environmental impact statement 
for another offshore wind development in the region is a case in point for what that might mean for American coastal indigenous groups. It references legally mandated ongoing consultations with six federally recognized tribes, but restricts the potential impacts of the wind farm on the tribes to the cultural, historical, and archeological resources section of the report. In doing so, this process may perpetuate the idea that indigenous peoples are a part of prehistory, archaeology, and the deep past, with no acknowledgement that the development of industrial scale offshore wind might affect them in other ways. So while some tribes do appear as legally mandated stakeholders in the planning process for offshore wind, tribal agency over energy transition is actually quite limited in practice. Energy transition here is another form of settler supremacy. For our team, this work raises questions about the process of energy transition on the island and in the region. Can renewable energy transitions ever be designed to have decolonial potential? What would that look like in this case and for the continued development of offshore wind? Do these concerns require that we shift our attention away from depoliticized conversations about the social acceptance of new infrastructure among static stakeholder populations? Could recognition justice of the past, present, and future become as important as procedural and distributive justice frameworks, which tend to assume we already know who and what matters? What do we actually want energy transitions to enable? This question seems even more keenly important at this very moment. Recently, I learned that the latest multi-million dollar offshore, offshore wind enterprise in our region has been named Mayflower Wind explicitly honoring the first European settlers in New England with no trace of irony. So in sum, I hope to have articulated how renewable energy transitions are also environmental justice issues. In the case of offshore wind transitions in New England, the injustice lies in the fact that black and indigenous populations have been historically removed from the ever gentrifying coastlines and islands ensuring that these groups in our region are not recognized in the legally mandated stakeholder consultation processes. And if they are recognized at all, it is in very narrow and limited ways that do not provide autonomy or sovereignty over energy. We live in a world shaped by big energy, a blend of private corporate finance and large public utilities whose aim is to provide energy cheaply and instantaneously in ways that appear almost effortless to the end user. We're dependent on such arrangements. And that dependence masks a host of injustices from access to affordability, to the re-territorialization of space, to exclusions from planning processes. The global transition to renewable sources of energy, which is essential for climate mitigation and adaptation, is no exception to the blind spots and erasures of big energy. And our rush to provide vast amounts of uninterrupted clean energy across whole continents we're giving up any opportunity to make renewable energy transition a force for situated local justice. We are instead reinforcing settler colonial values and uses of land and resources at the expense of anti-colonial and anti-racist possibilities of recognition justice. Localized environmental justice frameworks are very good at highlighting specific point source issues in specific places and populations, but they can be somewhat stymied in the face of such enormous global, regional, and long-term historical scale changes such as indigenous erasure, the post-emancipation migration of black populations to urban centers, and the highly uneven effects of a warming planet. Warming that resulted from the industrialization made possible by indigenous removal and black ens enslavement in the first place. We need a shift in legal and ethical outlook towards historical holism. We need intersectional environmentalism. The well-known legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw can help us here. Her term intersectionality speaks to the relations of power that undergird the way people, ideas, and things get classified and ordered. She writes about institutionalized social categories like race and gender and the blindness of governance structures that cannot understand how these categories are inextricably interconnected to disproportionately negate or subjugate whole swaths of human lived experience. Scholars like Crenshaw show us that there is, of course, no such thing as environmental degradation without this messy history of social categorization, hierarchy, 
and rampant supremacist imperialism. There is no sea level rise, coastal erosion, or chronic pollution without this history. And in turn, environmental conservation, sustainable development, and renewable energy transition, also ecological restoration, seem all to proceed along the same path laid out by supremacy, the path made to reproduce the world in the image of those who seek to exploit it. We can continue down this path, although we already know where it ends. Or we can stop the branding, the market-based solutions, the hierarchical networks, the greenwashed rhetorics, and the supremacist master planning and reorient ourselves towards new ends. In closing, I want to briefly expose you to a few more scholars who can help guide us towards more intersectional thinking in the areas of environmental justice. The first one is scholar Jean O'Brien, whose book Firsting and Lasting specifically talks about the history of indigenous erasure in New England. Another person you should know about is Max Lebron. She's an a environmental scientist in Newfoundland. Uh, and her book that is coming out very shortly, if it's not out already, but I think coming out this year is called Pollution is Colonialism. If you're active on Twitter, you should follow Leah Thomas and in her intersectional environmentalism. It's an example of youth movements. And Here's a scholar who just moved to the region at Brown University, Miles Lennon, and I'm a big fan of his recent article in Energy Research and Social Science, Decolonizing Energy, Black Lives Matter and Technoscientific Expertise in the Amidst Solar Transitions. So those are just some resources, um, just a very few that might, you might find interesting, and of course this will be shared later. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I will hand it back to the organizers. Thank you, Amelia, for um, bringing us to a more academic approach to some of these questions. Um, I know we started with some more like basic introduction to the topics and some of the policy aspects. And I think that through the three presentations, we're able to see the different communities and environments that are impacted by environmental justice and the different possibilities for us to start begin thinking and tackling these issues. So thank you, everyone. Um, we do have a few questions and a few minutes to answer them. Um, Amelia, since you're already kind of on the spot, I think, I'll ask you first. So uh, you kind of started to tackle one of the questions. It's in the chat, actually, not in the Q&A. But someone was asking about um, what we can do to better support Indigenous people or better include Indigenous peoples in clean energy um, transitions. Well, I mean, that's a great question. I think the, you know, a basic answer is to um, make sure that the representatives, the appropriate representatives from tribal organizations are invited to the table in decision making processes, and that they're invited in a way that is appropriate for their own um, timelines and processes and, and life ways, um, instead of, you know, forcing them or people to conform to existing uh, timelines and, and structures. I think making sure that recognize, federally recognized, but also non-federally -rec recognized or, uh, groups um, are involved in the process in ways that are meaningful to them um, and not you know, over-determining what that is at the outset, what that means at the outset is a you know, basic step. Great. Thank you, Amelia. Um, we only have a few minutes. I think I'm going to give you each one question. Um, so Carrie had said that she wanted to answer this question live. So how does environmental justice affect nutrient pollution? So I guess I would just say, you know, nutrient pollution, um, for those who, who don't know, is, um, is pollution that can um, come from, say, fertilizers. Um, it can even come from natural sources such as leaves um, that get swept up by the stormwater. And again, I'm going back to, to the stormwater um, that picks up all of these, these pollutants and these extra nutrients 
um, and brings them to the local waterways. Um, how, how it comes together with EJ communities is um, often EJ communities are, are built out, they're located where there is industry or commercial development um, or uh, high density residential um, development. And again, those hard surfaces mean that water is going to pick up things. It, it, it allows things to be spilled onto those hard surfaces and, um, and get picked up to the local waterways. And then in those waterways or lakes and ponds, um, that's where you get um, the results of the nutrient pollution, which is um, algal blooms um, and, and lack of oxygen. Um, and um, it really impacts the, um, uh, the wildlife that lives there, and it affects the way that you can use those um, those water resources. So, I'm not sure that answers the question, but um, happy to uh, expand on that. Great, thank you, Carrie. Um, I know Betsy also had a question she wanted to answer live, so um, I'll read it out in case everyone can't see it. Uh, it says, the U.S. has done an excellent job in sanctioning ghettos. Some would say this is the first egregious violation of equality. How important is breaking down ghettos for promotion of environmental justice? How can that be done? Should it be done? Hi, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to speak for people who live in uh, what you describe as ghettos. <laughs> I'm going to try to speak around it a little bit um, uh, because there, there are so many issues of racial and economic justice that are not environmental justice. And, and uh, like Amelia was talking about the intersectionality of these things. So this is a really complicated question. But as I work with um, local environmental justice organizations like Green Roots in Chelsea or ACE that's in Roxbury, uh, I don't hear people saying we want to get out of our neighborhood or we want, you know, something to change uh, that disperses us somewhere else. They want to stay where they are. Uh, they want it to stay affordable, not get gentrified um, and also not be polluted. You know, they want they want it to be changed. Um, so I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I, it, it feels to me like the, the breaking down of ghettos sounds like something again that the settler, the settler colonial people would try to, try to do and have done. You remember the old uh, East End in Boston and urban renewal uh, where they just came in and bulldozed the whole neighborhood in the interest of improving things and those communities were destroyed and just dispersed. So um, I think, you know, the first, the first thing I, is to let the people in the communities speak for themselves about what they want for their communities. And then the second thing I wanted to say about that is uh, to refer you back to that uh, list of uh, bills, in, at least in Massachusetts, that are in, because they, they are intersectional bills, a number of them. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll just highlight one of them, uh, SD 2102, uh, HD 3338, uh, which is from uh, the Mass Renews Alliance, which is the EJ group, is called the Building Justice with Jobs Act. And it's about going into EJ communities, uh, you know, mostly low income communities of color and addressing climate change, environmental justice and racial justice all at the same time by rehabbing a lot of housing, uh, much of which is rental housing, um, or, or low income owned housing, uh, rehabbing it, making it better insulated, uh, cleaner energy coming out of it and the jobs to create this energy transition and bettering of the community would be, um, people in those local communities would be trained for those jobs. So it's, it's an employment bill, it's a climate bill, it's a racial justice bill, it's an environmental justice bill, you know, addressing all of those things in one. And that's, that feels to me like the kind of thinking we need to be doing where um, people in the, lo in, in the local communities, um, that we're not, we're not thinking for them what they need, but they're, they're saying, this is what we need. And we also need the jobs, you know, that are gonna be created in this clean energy transition. Uh, it, that are going to be implemented in our own communities. So that's at least a partial answer to that question. 
Yeah, thank you, Betsy. It was a big question for sure. Yeah. Um, so we are getting close to the end of things, but to wrap it all up, um, thank you to our presenters for sharing a lot of information and also steps forward in learning about existing policy and different readings that we can do. The resources from today's um, conference will be sent out in the next few days um, with all of the links um, and that should help um, in continuing our learning and activism around environmental justice. Uh, and I'm going to pass it back now to Sam so that we can continue continue wrapping up our session for today. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you everybody for attending our uh, conference session today. Um, there is an evaluation link that has been posted in the chat. I have heard that some people might be having trouble with that. Um, if that continues, we'll make sure that that link for the evaluation gets emailed out to you. And we'd like to encourage you to register for the two upcoming sessions. Um, so our second session is supporting public access to recreational waters, and that is uh, next Wednesday the 24th at 3.30, just like this one. Um, and then the following Wednesday, the 31st, is our third session, um, Environmental Justice, The First Steps. Um, so we encourage you to register and thank you for attending today's session. And we hope to see you again. <laughs>